Guys, the Bible has a secret code that lists the names of all the people who are secretly controlling the world. They control the Illuminati, who controls the Freemasons, who controls your 5G network towers. And the only way to defeat the one world government is to share all of my conspiracy theories with your friends on Facebook. Alright, if you've had a Christian talk like that, they were probably influenced by Gnosticism. Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where I build this big church in Minecraft while I talk about Christianity. And today I'm going to be going to the Nether to get some resources while I talk about the heresy of Gnosticism and five ways that it has influenced the modern church. So when I talk about Gnosticism, I'm not claiming that there are literal Gnostic cults that exist today. Gnosticism was a heresy that existed in like the second century. A bunch of Christians fell to the Gnostic heresy and they believed that instead of traditional Christianity. So, what I'm talking about today isn't literal Gnosticism, but it's the ideas of Gnosticism that have influenced the church in various ways. And I'm just going to quickly just walk through this city of Manplatten. This is the Catholic city, because a lot of people have done a lot of work. A lot of people in the server have built a lot of stuff in Manplatten, the Catholic city. So I thought I'd just walk around it before I go to the nether portal that is in this city, so I can go to the nether and get some black stone to work on my university. So, what is Gnosticism? Gnosticism is basically the idea that this world is evil. The material world is evil. And Gnostics have a whole mythology built around it. They think that this material world we live in now was created by some evil god called the Demiurge. And the purpose of our faith is to gain secret knowledge so we can escape this evil world and go into, into the, the good world created by the good god. So there's a lot of mythology involved, and that's why I say that there are very few literal Gnostics today who literally believe all the Gnostic mythology, but the ideas of Gnosticism still influence the church in various ways today, particularly the ideas of secret knowledge and of thinking this world is bad and needing to acquire secret knowledge to escape it. So the first way in which Gnosticism presents itself in today's world is the idea of conspiracy theories. Now, I'm not saying that every conspiracy theory is, is always wrong, but this conspiracy theory culture of thinking that the fundamental truths necessary to understand our world are kept hidden from us and that you need a sort of secret knowledge to understand it. Yes, I know that there are big scandals that the government or whoever else is in power might cover up, but the conspiracy theory culture goes, be, uh, goes beyond that. They have this mindset that the average person is a sheep, that the average person is blind and the truth is hidden from the average person, and they are the only ones with access to that secret knowledge. And that comes from Gnosticism. Gnosticism says that we cannot easily know truth from this world because Gnosticism says there is an evil god controlling this world. And that is similar to the conspiracy theorists' idea that all the truth we think is true is regulated by, like, evil elite forces, whether it's the government or billionaires or the government billionaires or the Freemasons or the Illuminati or your high school math teacher. They always pinpoint some group. But basically, the common theme is that those in power successfully hide truth from the vast majority of people, whether it's the Illuminati or whether it's the evil god called the Demiurge, and that the only way to escape it is to acquire their secret knowledge. So Christians should not get wrapped up in conspiracy theories, because we Christians believe that there is a good god sovereign over this world, and while there are evil forces at work in this world, God is gracious enough to restrain those evil forces such that we can know truth in this world. Truth is not hidden. The truth of Christianity is blatantly obvious to the whole world, and the only reason some people can't see it is because of their own sin and because of their own hardened hearts. So, and aside from the message of the gospel that actually brings salvation, Christianity also believes in natural revelation, that basic truths about the world, whether like science or stuff like that, can be accessed just by observing the world. Christianity traditionally has a high view of the human intellect's ability to comprehend the world. 
the only reason people don't come to the right conclusions is because of sin. Because Jesus said people could see someone rise from the dead and still not believe. So yeah, the conspiracy theory culture that treats everyone like sheep and says that um, they are the only way you can understand truth is not Christianity. Because if Christians are associated with people who believe in conspiracy theories, then the world is going to think that Christ is a conspiracy theory. And that's why I would go so far as to say radical conspiracy theorists that claim to be Christians, such as some Christians who are flat earthers, are actually blaspheming Christ. Because the Bible says not to take the, the name of the Lord in vain. And that doesn't simply mean saying blasphemous phrases. It, it does mean that, but it's also more than that. It also means don't tarnish the name of God. That's why we're not supposed to use the, the name of the Lord in vain, because the name of the Lord needs to be something that's sacred. And if you use the name of the Lord to defend something that's so blatantly false, something that everyone knows is false, and to get people to associate the name of the Lord with falsehood, such as Christians who are flat earthers, they are blaspheming the Lord. So that is why, like, if you are a Christian and you fall into these conspiracy theory traps, you need to you need to get out of that trap. Because I understand it. I get it. The world is crazy. We want an explanation for why things are the way they are. We want someone to blame. But the Bible gives us an answer. The Bible says that sin is the reason things are as bad as they are. And we have no one to blame but ourselves. So yes, there are a lot of evil people in the world, but I got bad news for you. You're one of them. That's why Jesus had to die for you. All right, next up, the next way in which Gnosticism influences the parts of the church today is with an anti-scientific mindset. Now, it depends on which church you're talking about. Generally, the Catholic Church is not influenced by um, an anti-scientific mindset, and the Presbyterian Church less so. But if you're talking about independent fundamental Baptist churches or non-denominational churches or especially Seventh-day Adventist churches, there is a lot, there is a big anti-science culture in those churches. And um, being against science is, I think, um, a soft form of Gnosticism. Because the church basically invented science, starting with the assumption that God has made a world that we can understand, that we can learn about. That is why the church has done so much good for the world. One of the reasons is the church literally invented what we know as modern science. Of course, everyone has always had a scientific mindset. All humans have always done scientific inquiry. Like, I've heard a story of like a seven-year-old who did a scientific experiment to prove the tooth fairy wasn't real by like, uh, when she lost her tooth, waiting a day to tell her parents, and it wasn't until after she told her parents that the tooth fairy came and delivered her tooth, and that's how she scientifically proved the tooth fairy wasn't real. So all humans have a scientific, um, a scientific mind, just by nature. But Christians have done the most to advance what's called the scientific method. However, Gnosticism denies the idea that we live in a comprehensible world. So that's why a lot of the anti-science attitudes among Christians, I think, stem from Gnosticism. Now, what they'll say is that, yeah, we can understand the world, we can, but the elites who are in charge of the scientific institutions, they're so corrupt that we can't trust them. But the Bible speaks of something called common grace. I mean, that's not the term the Bible uses, but the Bible does say that God has ordained things like the government and just regular earthly social structures as a way to restrain evil. So common grace is what theologians call it. Common grace is the idea that um, although this world is filled with evil, by God's grace he has set it up so that there are structures put in place in this world, like the government, like the family structure, like other cultural structures, that provide a general sense of an imperfect, but still a, a good stability so we can function in the world. Because if everyone who is not a Christian was like a complete psycho, then Christians couldn't survive in the world. So we do, there is a sense in which we can get along with the secular world due to common grace. And I think science falls in the realm of common grace. Science is a common grace. Christians should not be afraid of science, and I see a lot of parallels between radical young earth creationism and Gnosticism. I'm not a creationist, I, I believe in evolution. I have a video explaining why if you think it's in incompatible with the Bible. Um, 
and I'm not saying all people who hold to young earth creationism are necessarily Gnostics, but I do think there's a strong parallel, especially a lot of Christians don't know the origins of young earth creationism. Young earth creationism, like as a dogmatic belief, was not taught in the church until pretty recently. Um, the church used to be a bit more agnostic about the question of how old the earth is. Like St. Augustine, probably the most influential figure in Western Christianity was not a young, young earth creationist. And John Calvin, um, he did seem to take the six days as literal, but he also said we must not reject the findings of science, even if it comes from secular, non-Christian scientists. Um, young earth creationism, as a dogmatic teaching, started with the Seventh-day Adventist prophetess Ellen White, who had a dream about the world being created in six days, and that bled into modern evangelicalism, where people said, if you don't believe in a literal six-day creation, you don't believe the Bible at all. So, Seventh-day Adventism, I see a lot of parallels between that and between, like, Gnosticism. Because generally when some Christian believes in some crazy conspiracy theory, I'll just, out of curiosity, ask them what their denomination is. And usually it's something like Baptist or non-denominational. Um, but it's also often Seventh-day Adventist, because, I do, because they um, were started based on a failed prediction of when Jesus would come back. They do tend to fall prey to a lot of the, the conspiracy theories and stuff. And I, I don't think Seventh Day Adventists are explicitly heretical, but a lot of it, a lot of Seventh Day Adventism is is really sus in my opinion. And that leads me to the third form of Gnosticism that exists in the church, and that is basically rejection of the church. There are a lot of people who claim to be Christians but distrust the church. They think they can be a Christian just by uh, individually reading their Bible, but they distrust the church. They think, oh, I don't trust the church because it's too corrupt, or it's too liberal, or it's too this, or it's too that, or because the vast majority of the church has been completely apostate for most of its history. Um, anytime somebody says that, I don't know, the church has been completely corrupted ever since the Council of Nicaea, or something like that, that's how you know you're talking to an idiot. I'm serious. Because anyone who has actually studied real history knows that that's not the case. And I think it's a, a form of Gnosticism to say that God would basically give us a church. Jesus said to Peter, like, you are on, on this rock, I will build my church. It is Gnosticism to say that God started a church, but the vast majority of the visible church is not the real church. That makes no sense at all. So that is really a low view of the Holy Spirit to say that, um, you know, you can be a Christian, but you completely distrust the church because the Holy Spirit promised to guide the church. So it's kind of like disbelieving what Jesus promised. It's disbelieving the work of the Holy Spirit to say that you cannot trust the institutional church because of how corrupt it is or because they don't really believe the secret message of the Bible that somehow you have access to. So, and it, that idea that like, the, the church is completely missing the true message of the Bible, but somehow you're smart enough to have access to the true message of the Bible. That's Gnosticism, because it's this whole idea, once again, of, of secret knowledge, that somehow you have access to knowledge that nobody else has, and um, the idea that only a very select few group of people can really have access to this secret knowledge that can save them from the horrible ways of this world. Like, I, I make videos about different denominations, and I try to promote unity between the, the mainstream Christian denominations, because we all worship the same God. And anytime I do that, I'll get comments saying like, and all of these denominations are deceived, all these denominations are, are false Christians, you need to have like a, a personal relationship with... It's like, you think people of these denominations don't have a personal relationship with Christ? What makes you so special? Seriously, the, the, the arrogance I see in some comments, some people thinking like they have access to ultimate truth and like 99.9% .9 of other people are completely led astray. Um, that sort of arrogance, once again, comes from Gnosticism. Now, the fourth... A uh, form of sort of Gnostic influence I see in the church is less severe, but it's also more common, and it's what I call sinking ship theology. I've talked about this many times on my channel. Sinking ship theology is the idea that this world is a sinking ship, and the purpose of Christianity is to escape this world and go to heaven. 
Now, it is true that we believe in heaven, but the main message of the gospel isn't about escaping this world, it's about the redemption of this world. It's about the kingdom of heaven coming down to earth and transforming it. So the goal of being a Christian isn't simply waiting to go to heaven, it's really improving this world in anticipation of when Jesus is going to come back and restore all things. So we do believe in heaven, but our final hope isn't a heaven that is detached from this world. It's the new heavens and the new earth, which is heaven and earth becoming one, so that this world we live in right now is going to be restored and redeemed. Whereas a lot of people, especially those with a more dispensa dispensational premillennial eschatology view of the end times, they really make it sound like um, uh, they really make it sound like it's sinking ship theology. And premillennialism does tend to lead to that. Um, I'm personally amillennial. I'm not postmillennial, but postmillennials usually don't have this problem either. But premillennials often do because if you think that the kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ, doesn't really begin until Jesus comes back, then you're generally going to have a pessim pessimistic view of how history is going to go leading up to that point. And speaking of eschatology and dispensationalism and the end times, the last way in which Gnosticism influences the church is rapture theology. So throughout all of history, people have had slight disagreements in the church on the end times. Some people are post-millennial, some people are amillennial, some people are historic premillennial. But a belief in the rapture, and by the way, when I say rapture, I'm defining it as this idea that Jesus is going to briefly come back before his second coming to snatch all the believers off the earth before the earth goes into some great tribulation or something. And some people believe in, I don't know, what's called a mid-trib rapture. Um, but this idea that all the believers are going to get sucked off the earth, that is rapture theology. And no one in the church believed that until the mid-1800s when a complete weirdo named John Nelson Darby, who had a very sketchy personal life, had a completely brand new way to interpret the Bible. So, um, I should make a video explaining why the rapture is not biblical. Uh, I'll probably do that soon, but generally speaking, uh, there's this one verse in Thessalonians that says we're going to be caught up with Jesus in the air, and people think that's proof of the rapture. No, what's really going to happen, the way it's always been interpreted in church history, and if you look at the surrounding verses, it's, it's clear that that's what that's talking about. Um, Yes, we're, we are going to meet Jesus in the air, but that's at his second coming. That's not Jesus snatching people off the earth before his second coming. When Jesus comes back down to earth, we're going to meet him in the air and then descend back down with him. So it's not like we're meeting Jesus halfway in the air and then he's going to take us back up to heaven. It's we're meeting Jesus in the air and then we're going to descend down to earth with him. Sort of like a parade because it's Jesus' triumphal entry into this world. So why is rapture theology like Gnosticism? Well, if you think the thing that Christians are looking forward to is getting snatched off the earth, you're not going to care about redeeming this world because you think it's going to be inevitable that things are going to get worse and worse and worse in this world and you're just waiting for Christians to be snatched off. And that destroys a central aspect of the gospel. A central aspect of the gospel, like Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, is to be salt and light in this world. Christians are to have a transforming, positive influence on this world. But if you think that the world's just going to inevitably get worse and we're just waiting to leave this horrible place, that destroys motivation to improve the world. And you see that. Christians and churches who believe in the rapture have never profoundly impacted the world for the better the way that the traditional churches have. Traditional churches used to build hospitals and universities and all these great things to spread the kingdom of God here on earth. But Christians who believe in the rapture, um, which is completely unbiblical, I'm going to make a video explaining why the rapture is unbiblical, but for now, before I do, I'm going to leave a link in the description to a video by a Lutheran pastor explaining why the rapture is unbiblical. No one believed it before the 1850s or whatever, and there's a reason nobody in the church believed it, because it's simply not biblical, and if you think the church was deceived for the vast majority of its history, that's Gnosticism. I'm sorry, that's Gnosticism, Patrick. I don't know if you guys get that reference. If you do, you're very based. But yeah, if you think that the Christians are just going to get snatched off the world, why care about improving this world? Alright, those are the five ways in which Gnosticism influences the, the world today. So the antidote to Gnosticism is simply just read the Bible. 
read the message of Jesus specifically. Jesus' entire message was not about how to escape this terrible world and go to heaven. Jesus' message in the Gospels is about the kingdom of God here on earth. And that's kind of why the early Gnostics, like the real original Gnostics, that's why they wrote their own Gnostic Gospels, because they knew that the real Gospels completely contradicted everything they were trying to say. So yeah, if you read the message of Jesus, it's not just about how to go to heaven when you die. It's about the kingdom of heaven here on earth, and that is the hope that Christians have. So thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you guys later.